Can the GOP health care bill be saved? We got a president who thinks bold, thinks big, wants to act, and wants to get us to the finish line. Speaker Ryan says the president is negotiating. Christian persecution at the hands of ISIS. Representative Jeff Fortenberry gives us a progress report on the one year anniversary of the genocide declaration. Fleeing civil war. The Pope thanks the president of Lebanon for welcoming more than a million Syrian refugees. Our report on the crisis from Rome. And all things Irish. The country's prime minister visits the White House, plus corned beef and a special dispensation. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, March 16th, 2017. Good evening from Washington, D.C., and thank you to those of you joining us from around the world for news from a Catholic perspective. I'm Lauren Ashburn. The move to defund Planned Parenthood and replace Obamacare takes another step forward, although Speaker Ryan admits it needs changes to actually pass the House floor. Correspondent Jason Calvi is following the developments on Capitol Hill. Good evening, Jason. Lauren, the health care plan was just one vote shy of being shot down. Three conservative Republicans voted against their own party's plan, including Virginia's Dave Bratt. The current bill contains too much of Obamacare structure. Virginia Representative Dave Bratt and two other members of the conservative House Freedom Caucus, including South Carolina's Mark Sanford, voted against their party's health care bill. But it still passed the House Budget Committee. We need to take this once in a century opportunity uh, to make these structural changes to get the federal government out of health care, right? Return power back to the states and the people, and we'll still have a safety net. How are you doing? It shows the difficulty Republicans will have in getting the votes needed for it to pass on the House floor next week. Even chief salesman Speaker Paul Ryan admits the current bill needs changes. Enter the author of The Art of the Deal, the President of the United States. It's something I haven't seen in a long time. This president is getting deeply involved. He is helping bridge gaps in our conference. He is a constructive force to help us get to a resolution so that we get consensus on how to repeal and replace Obamacare. And Budget Committee Chairman Tennessee Republican Diane Black says she stands behind the GOP bill. And it is our response to the outcry from our own constituents to rescue them from Obamacare. But every single Democrat in committee opposed the GOP bill. They point to the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office findings that the Republican bill would boot 14 million people from insurance next year. That is not the compassionate way. That is not the Good Samaritan. That's not the faith that I have. The pro-life group Priests for Life praised today's committee vote approving the bill which defunds Planned Parenthood for one year. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says any repeal of Obamacare should include a replacement plan that makes sure the millions who rely on it won't lose access to health care. Lauren? Jason, do we know what the president is doing to change the bill? Well, the president told Fox News yesterday that the GOP, GOP plan was very preliminary. And on Air Force One, he says uh, there's a lot going on. That it might get all mixed up, but they'll come up with something. The White House is reaching out to these conservatives who right now are skeptical of the GOP plan. Correspondent Jason Calvi on Capitol Hill. Thank you, Jason. President Trump says he'll take the fight over his second immigration order all the way to the Supreme Court. This comes after federal judges in Maryland and Hawaii blocked it from going into effect today. The order would have barred people from Iran, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, Syria and Yemen from entering the U.S. for 90 days. It also would have blocked all refugees for 120 days. The Trump administration unveils a $1.15 trillion budget today. The president is keeping his campaign promises of boosting defense spending while cutting some domestic programs. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby has a breakdown of the proposed budget from the White House. Lauren, the president's budget proposal includes an unprecedented investment in school choice, giving working class families the option to use public funds to help cover private school tuition. But building up the military is his number one priority for the safety of the American people. The Trump administration calls the president's proposal, America First, a hard power budget. 
money to the Defense Department goes up by 9 percent. Other winners are Homeland Security, up 7 percent, and Veterans Affairs, up 6 percent. Offsetting this, the EPA dropping 31 percent, the State Department cut by 29 percent, and the Departments of Agriculture and Labor each going down by 21 percent. President Trump promised on the campaign trail he would boost defense spending and take out ISIS. We want to deter, avoid, and prevent conflict through our unquestioned military strength. The president's plan is a welcome one for Romina Baccia, an economist and expert in government spending. She says the budget marks a stark contrast from that of the Obama administration. He also understands that the federal government has grown too large in size and scope, so he's right-sizing the government by cutting domestic programs that we should no longer fund. Baccia says the president's goal is to let states put money where they think it's most needed. Democrats call the budget reckless. Our strength depends on the power of our diplomacy, the health of our economy, and the vitality of our communities, all of which are undermined by the president's budget. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson disagrees, arguing his own agency needs to cut the fat. The level of spending that the State Department has been undertaking in the past, in particular in this past year, is simply not sustainable. In this budget, some programs would be cut completely. That includes the National Endowment for the Arts, legal aid for the poor, and low-income heating assistance. The budget does address the border wall, allotting $1.4 billion this year. Lauren? Wyatt, this is not the president's full budget. I'm hearing it's the skinny budget. Is that right? Yes, Lauren, absolutely. It's what's called the skinny budget. It doesn't provide a line-by-line -line breakdown of each department. We don't expect to see those. And the reform, we expect first to see reforms of proposal and then the president's full budget, which will be expected in May. Lauren. Correspondent Wyatt Goolsby at the White House. Thank you, Wyatt. Joining us now is Shai Akabas. I hope I got that right, Director of Fiscal Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Did I? Very close. Okay, <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us anyway. President Trump's budget is slashing the size of government, as we just saw. Uh, eliminates entire agencies, includes money for the wall, increases spending for defense. How much weight should we give this? Is it going to go anywhere? So there's two important things, I think, for our viewers to understand that were uh, briefly mentioned in the, in the coverage. So first, this is not a budget proposal. This is the president's outline for what he wants to do with the domestic and defense spending in the budget that is appropriated on an annual basis. And in May, what will happen? That will be the rest of the outline that he proposes, and that will be the, hopefully the full budget. So then we will see programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Which he and, said he won't touch. Right. And the tax side of the equation included. And that's when you get the complete picture of the budget. So that's the first element. The second is that this is a proposal from the president to the Congress as to what his priorities are. And I think it's much more indicative of that than a guidepost of what we're actually going to see get enacted. Because a lot of people are talking about all of these programs that could potentially help the poor being cut. What you're saying is this is a guidepost. Right. That doesn't mean that this is going to happen. That's, this is how the president has outlined what his priorities are. And Congress, we've already seen some reaction from certainly Democrats, but also several Republicans who are concerned about the magnitude of some of these cuts. For example, the State Department, 31 percent cut, which I know you mentioned, and that has brought a lot of criticism from folks who believe that that will negatively impact our defense position internationally. Of course, and I think that other countries are going to have to pick up more of the bill for things like the United Nations and the World Bank. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. If we pull back to the scale that he's talking about from various international organizations, that would leave somebody else needing to pick up the tab. But the, the Congress really is, in the end, the final arbiter of, of the budget. How much support can the White House expect from Congress on this? So there's certainly support among many Republicans for reducing the scope of the government as a whole and for increasing defense spending. There are several conservatives who are actually concerned that the defense spending increase is not significant enough. And then there are others, maybe more falling Not significant that. enough, $54 billion. So it depends what level you measure it from. So that, that's an important element of this. But I think what's in the broad scheme of things, the Defense Department has actually been restrained in recent years because of what's called the sequester caps that were put in place about five years ago. By the Obama administration. Correct, and in a deal with the Republican Congress. And so what we have now is actually a Defense Department that is below its historical average as a percentage of the economy. And so these increases are not by historical standards that large. So there are some defense hawks that think they're not actually large enough. But on the domestic side of things, I think you see some cuts here that are at best unrealistic 
and at worst counterproductive and, and damaging because cuts like $200 million to the IRS budget, right. we already have a large gap in what we collect in taxes versus what we're supposed to be collecting. And if you further reduce their manpower, that's only going to get bigger. All right. Thank you so much, Shai. Akabis. Akabis, Director of Fiscal Policy at the Bipartisan Policy Center. Thanks, Thanks for joining for us. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson on his first official trip to Asia says 20 years of policies against North Korea have failed. He urges the country to abandon its nuclear and ballistic missile programs, calling them dangerous and unlawful. Tillerson said the administration is in the process of conducting a policy review. The Senate confirms the president's pick for National Intelligence Director. Former Indiana Senator Dan Coats was sworn in this afternoon. So help me down. So help me down. Coates is now President Trump's top intelligence official. He'll oversee 16 other intelligence agencies. He succeeds James Clapper, who retired just before President Trump took office. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Officers arrest a 16-year-old high school student in southern France for shooting a principal and two others. Police in Garas cordoned off the shooting scene. You can see worried residents gathered outside, surrounded by emergency vehicles. The French government sent out an alert warning about the shooting. Investigators have not revealed a motive, but they say there is no reason to suspect terrorism. 600 miles away in Paris, a letter exploded at the French office of the International Monetary Fund, slightly injuring one person. It's unclear who sent the homemade explosive by regular mail. France remains under a state of emergency following two years of deadly attacks by Islamic extremists. American Iraqi forces give differing accounts of progress in Mosul. Iraqi forces say they've driven ISIS out of more than half of the western part of Mosul nearly a month after launching an operation to take back the city. U.S. commanders say they've only recaptured a little over a third. Troops declared eastern Mosul fully liberated in January. Catholic bishops in Bolivia speak out about a proposal to abort children born in poverty. Parliament is considering authorizing abortion if the mother is in extreme poverty or doesn't have sufficient resources to support a child. The bishops are asking legislators to defend the right to life, citing the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. As the Syrian civil war begins its seventh year, Syrian doctors speak of the horrors they've witnessed while in Aleppo. A doctor talking to members of Congress Wednesday can only describe the events as hell. One pregnant woman survived an explosion, but shrapnel in her body cut her unborn baby in half. You can visit our partners at catholicnewsagency.com to read more of victims' stories. The Netherlands vote to re-elect Mark Rutte, fending off the far-right anti-immigrant candidate. The prime minister easily won yesterday's election, defying polls that suggested a close race. Leaders from around Europe are welcoming the outcome of the election. And we're learning a little bit more about a royal visit to the Vatican. Prince Charles and his wife Camilla, the Duchess of Cornwall, will meet with Pope Francis during their next tour. The future King of England and his wife will also visit Amatrice, a town destroyed by an earthquake last year. The British Embassy says the Duchess of Cornwall will tour the ruins of an ancient city near Naples destroyed by Mount Vesuvius. The trip starts two weeks from tomorrow. Pope Francis thanks the president of Lebanon for welcoming Syrian refugees to his country. The remarks came during a private meeting between the pontiff and President Michel Aoun, who is beginning a tour of European countries after his election last October. The two leaders say they're grateful Lebanese political parties filled the vacancy that left the country without a president for two years. Vatican correspondent Mary Shevlin joins us from Rome. Mary, the Pope thanked the Lebanese president for providing this safe haven for people who are fleeing the civil war in Syria. How grave is the refugee crisis in Lebanon? Lauren, it's quite grave. If we think of that, Lebanon is a country of six million inhabitants. They've welcomed over a million refugees fleeing the war in Syria. So about one in every six people living in Lebanon right now is a refugee. And in terms of square footage of the country itself, it is the country with the densest population of refugees in the world. So it's uh, something that the Pope is applauding them for, for their open door policy at a time when Europe is debating whether or not to close its doors in this growing refugee crisis. The Vatican wants to hold Lebanon up as an example of what to do. 
What else dominated their conversation? Well, they also looked besides Syria, Lauren, they looked at the other conflicts uh, going on in the region and how to find a political solution to these conflicts that are taking place, not only in Syria, but in the Middle East. And they're looking at the situation, the ever uh, growing precarious situation of Christians in the Middle East as they face persecution, it seems, on, on all fronts. So what specifically is Lebanon doing to, to make these things happen, if anything? Well, I know that as they head to their elections in June, they're set for June, the parliamentary elections. There's a debate raging in Lebanon right now about reforming the electoral laws. Again, they were without a president for about over two years, so that doesn't happen again. How can they reform those laws uh, to make sure that everyone is happy? One thing that they're trying to do is, as the president of that country is a Maronite Christian, of course, one of the only Christian heads of state in the Middle East, the people in his parliament are Maronite Christian as well. So the people are pushing for more diverse representation of all the Christian denominations in Lebanon. So I think, you know, the Holy Father certainly wants to encourage that today, how they have been able to work together and hopefully more diverse representation of all groups in the country. All right, Mary Shovlin, EWTN News Nightly Vatican Correspondent. Thanks, Mary, for joining us. Thank you, Lauren. Coming up, a Catholic Supreme Court justice speaks out on religious liberty and the one-year anniversary of the Middle East Genocide Declaration. Representative Jeff Fortenberry weighs in. Pope Francis focuses on taking care of the poor and homeless during his morning homily. Yo credo que hay sensatetto y poveri. The Holy Father says when people are surrounded by wealth, they lose their sense of direction. The Pope says those who know the poor and do nothing to help are sinners. He ended his homily saying we must ask the Lord to look into our hearts. Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito says the United States' dedication to religious liberty is being tested. He made the remarks last night during an event sponsored by a Catholic lawyers organization in New Jersey. Justice Alito mentioned Bob Dylan's lyrics when he said, quote, we are seeing this is coming to pass and you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. A wind is picking up that is hostile to those with traditional moral beliefs. This week marks the one-year anniversary since the U.S. declared the ISIS persecution of Christians genocide. Joining us now is Representative Jeff Fortenberry, who introduced the genocide resolution in the House that led to the declaration. The U.S. calls this persecution of Christians and other religious minorities genocide. What progress has been made in the past year? What this did was it immediately raised international consciousness as to the plight of the ancient religious traditions in the Middle East. ISIS's horror, their brutality toward others was well known, but I don't think the world understood that they were trying to exterminate entire groups of people based upon their religious tradition. That was the first step. What kind of commitment have you received from the Trump administration about the persecution of Christians? The president, as you will recall, about a month ago during the national prayer breakfast mentioned what was happening as genocide. That was very helpful. Clearly, that was in the forefront of his mind. I have personally dialogued with the vice president about the importance of marking this anniversary. I think there is an attempt to potentially do that at the White House if, if that doesn't occur in a public fashion. Nonetheless, it obviously is an ongoing consideration in terms of their deliberations about next policy steps to try to stop this horror, this grave injustice. Representative Fortenberry, is there additional legislation pending? That's a, a piece of legislation that is evolving as we speak, that's being drafted as we speak. It's called Accessories to Genocide. Those uh, shell companies or others who have directly assisted ISIS and their barbarism uh, will be potentially prosecuted. It's an attempt to get the information on these people and set up the conditions in which this can never happen again. Thank you so much, Nebraska Republican Jeff Fortenberry. Thank you. Up next, Catholic University donor Tim Bush tells me how he approaches business from a Catholic point of view. We need to reform the business sector so that it's not just about profits. And the Yiddish Prime Minister makes a splash in Washington on the eve of St. Patrick's Day.
Maintaining one's moral compass in the business world is not an easy task. I recently discussed the challenge with a leading Catholic businessman. Joining me now is Tim Bush, a Catholic lawyer and businessman. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Talk to me about Catholicism and capitalism. You say that capitalism is the most effective way to ease poverty, but that it must function in a moral climate, not easy. How do you ensure that that happens? Well, that's the, uh, the question of the day. And uh, so many times we as Catholics uh, talk about redistribution when in fact we really want to talk about co-creation. That's really a Catholic concept, co-creating with God and raising people up through their own efforts and giving them an opportunity through education and uh, entrepreneurship to, uh, to provide for themselves. How does Catholic social teaching guide you personally in business? Well, it's a continued formation. So we're all uh, continuing to evaluate that in the marketplace because our marketplace today, that's the problem with it, it's broke. We're all focused on short-term profits, rent seeking, and not on creating businesses and, and uh, viable jobs. So we as Catholics, as leaders, we need to reform the business sector so that it's not just about profits, it's about a holistic analysis of the business and the community. What would that look like? Say we're a large media corporation. Um, and you want to do that, and so instead of reinvesting in the, the company, what would you do? Reinvest in people, grow jobs? Well, I think it, reinvesting in the business is what it's all about. That does grow jobs and grows people. What we have is a, a mentality in our public markets as well as our private equity markets to make short-term profits, what they call rent-seeking, arbitraging, uh, instead of uh, focusing on the business. This comes as a result of consolidation, trying to make uh, uh, short-term trading profits instead of profits from the business. Seems like education is also a big priority for you. You've donated a significant amount to the Catholic University of America to put into their business school. Why is Catholic education so important to you? It's all about formation. We can't expect people to understand what they're supposed to do unless they're properly educated and uh, through, through education we can raise everyone up and uh, including ourselves because as we promote education we learn more ourselves. What advice would you give young people going into business? Going into business is very scary. I think most people, over 90 percent of people, don't go into business because they think it's too risky and uh, it, it is risky. There's no question about it. It's not a guarantee but neither is your job and so uh, I would uh, suggest that entrepreneurship, you might have more control over your destiny than working for uh, somebody sometimes. Tim Bush, Catholic lawyer and businessman, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Lauren. <laughs> Irish Prime Minister Enda Kenny is urging President Trump to help Irish people living in the U.S. illegally, saying they just want to make America great. The comments came as the Prime Minister visited the White House and Capitol today. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. President Trump proclaimed his love for Ireland and called the Prime Minister a new friend. Kenny has been critical of some of the President's campaign rhetoric, but described the meeting as good and friendly. He's returning to the White House tonight for a St. Patrick's Day reception. And speaking of St. Patty's Day, before you get ready to make corned beef and cabbage for dinner tomorrow, you have to remember it's a Friday in Lent. But depending on where you live, you may be off the hook. Dozens of dioceses around the country, including mine right here in Washington, D.C., are allowing a special dispensation, meaning you can eat meat tomorrow. You might want to do something on Saturday, like not eating meat or something positive. You want to check with your priest or your diocese, though, before you do it. That does it for us here, for all of us at EWTN News Nightly. To all of you around the world, thank you for joining us. I'm Lauren Ashburn. We leave you tonight with the Green White House. The North Fountain was just died in honor of St. Patrick's Day. It's a tradition that began in 2009. Good night and God bless.